it, are you? Uh, yeah. The microphone doesn't actually project anything, it just picks up the audio for the recording. All right. So it's best to have it clipped on. Okay. Sure. Oh, right. Okay. Just double tap the phone until it goes green. There we go. I know it's recording. Brilliant. Have a good talk. Thank you. Check, check, check. Can you hear me? Check, check, check. There's no mic. Speak loud. Uh, before the lunch, speak loud. You guys were there at the party last night, stayed back? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's Yeah, it was a long day and uh, it's too loud, right? <laughs> I agree. What time did you finish? The party? Uh, I came nine and a half nine, probably before that. But they said that the, it, it uh, went going to late, so they had a Initial tap of thousand pounds, and then you know, someone else. Five uh, hundred. Uh, five hundred. Then someone else five hundred as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it went thrice. <laughs> oh, here it is. That's good. Zero <laughs> You guys heading back to today? Yeah, I'm staying. How about you? I'm staying. I'm staying.
Sure. It's green, is it? Um, not at the minute, no. Took a click here. So, uh, welcome everyone uh, to my session on transforming outsourcing to drive reducing success. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, last session of the day, I guess, before keynote. Yes. Probably. So, yeah. And food after this, so double yeah. Uh, before we start, uh, can we just you know have a very quick uh, show of hands uh, for all those who are outsourcing? Either providing outsourcing services or outsourcing with partners or uh, planning to do that. So, you know, quick show of happy. Okay. Great, great. So, my name is Piyush Podar. Uh, I'm leading partnerships uh, at uh, Accelerant Technologies uh, and I'm leading UK and Asia Pacific regions. And I live in India, in Jaipur. And happy Holi. We just had this festival yesterday in India. It's a pretty Colorful festival, although I am here seeing only white everywhere. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, the challenge, the so the Drupal agency space, and I believe you know the majority of you are from agencies, either working with agencies or leading agencies. The Drupal agency space is uh, looking like a an negotiator. And what I mean to say is. Drupal is a, is a vast ecosystem with you know, ever-evolving uh, companies and, and businesses. But every company, every organization is, is fighting for a same pie, you know, a bigger piece of the same pie. The pie is pretty much the same. It, it, it keeps you know, growing a little bit at times. But everyone wants a bigger pie, piece of the pie in terms of business opportunities, market price size, and talent. And today we are going to focus on the talent aspect of agencies when it comes to growing their businesses. So because of this uh, 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 consolidation in the market, because of these challenges in the market, what leads to is competition and consolidation. So uh, oftentimes, you know, you are fighting or you're trying to uh, attract the same talent out there in the market. There are good developers out there, but there are not too many of them, right? But you still have to grow. You have so many business opportunities. Business is growing. Size of your business, the account sizes are growing, deal sizes are going. You need to deliver those projects. You need to deliver those solutions. But the available talent pool, the, the production capacity is still the same. And you're still fighting to find more developers. Developers are there, but they also look for good opportunities. <coughs> now, how do, we, how do we solve this is something I'll take you through. Um, I did a quick uh, research and found out this recent survey uh, conducted by EY and Tech North. This is uh, this survey was based on uh, north of London as a region, and the interesting finding from this survey was 
that uh, the digital scale gap is still a significant factor across the north, with 58% of digital agencies uh, in the region say that finding talent is their key concern. And I believe a majority of other companies in the other cities of this, this country are also facing similar patterns. Uh, you can see, you know, you can go to this link and you can see the detailed survey. There are other data points that are going to go there as well. So how are companies doing it? So there are two or three ways where, where, where companies are trying to do is One, you're trying to hire interns, juniors, fresh grads, developers, and trying to train them and upskill them so that they can become good developers. But there are certain challenges associated with that. I'm not saying that this is a bad way of growing your talent base. Uh, we also do it sometimes. But it's not very effective in the short term, especially when you have demand spikes, you have uh, you know, some big projects coming up very soon. Hiring developers, training them, needs a lot of resources, consumes a lot of time. Experience will only come with time. So a fresh developer will only become a good experienced developer in a couple of months or years. He cannot be uh, uh, completely productive and start delivering projects all by himself, day one. And then there are issues of attrition, churn, <coughs> which every company is facing, right? Other uh, developers uh, are, uh, you know, trying to move to. So, you know, if you train developers, oftentimes you also found this happening in, in other, other countries outside UK, is that you, um, you train developers, and then some, you know, after a few days or, you know, a few months or a few years, they'll, they'll start moving to other companies. So few companies have become training grounds for developers, while other companies have become you know, places where they would like to go. Also depends on the HR uh, advertising and, you know, how they attract those developers. So it's again a challenge. One other way is Acquire. Uh, you identify a company, uh, agency who's got good development uh, capacity. They want to grow, but they're having growth challenges. They have good production capacity. So you go and you, you acquire them. Uh, this is a strategy that has been pretty prominent in the IT industry. But then again, it has got challenges, like it's very costly. You have to, you know, up front you have to pay a lot of money to these companies to acquire them. It's risky. It needs a lot of vision alignment. The, the, uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of talent uh, available, but the, uh, the culture mismatch is, is something major that, that can fail here. Then there are communication and management challenges. Poor program management challenges. You know, they, may having, they may be having different programs than you may be having different projects. You know. Having a solid program management system in place uh, is, is needed and that takes a lot of time. The leadership alignment issues are there unless the leaderships are aligned. We have seen a lot of such ex ex examples where companies came together, uh, worked for a while and then subsequently failed. Uh, risk of impacting company culture. So you know, even if it fails and one day you decide that, okay, we are going to you know, end this thing, the core company's culture still gets affected, which is a problem. So the third option uh, then comes, which is outsourcing. Uh, these are some of the common benefits that we are all aware of, traditional benefits. Uh, competitiveness, uh, launching, you can launch new services and revenue streams based on the capabilities of these new companies. Uh, this allows you to maintain focus on your core business. Uh, it provides you greater ops flexibility. You don't need to worry about um, uh, managing the operations of the company that you are partnering with. It gives you more predictability. Uh, the two companies are still separate entities, so there's less challenges and less chances of culture mismatches or uh, you know, problems appearing and risk sharing. So this is a definition uh, I googled uh, somewhere. Uh, this is not an exact authority uh, uh, space from where I got it, but it says outsourcing is a business practice used by companies to reduce cost or improve efficiency by shifting tasks, operations, jobs, or processes to an external contracted third party. Functions that are contracted out can be performed by the third party, either on-site or off-site of the business. Sure. But does it work? So a um, few of you uh, just raised your hands and you said that you have outsourced. Any, anyone who has faced problems in outsourcing, you know, anyone has come across that problem is like a, yeah, we did that, you know, we tried a couple of companies, we worked with them, but didn't work out. So anyone, anyone would like to uh, tell us, you know, it failed, why, why it failed, what was the problem you guys faced? Sorry, yeah. Um, we uh, outsourced 
supposed to be great. Yeah, right. Was, uh, maybe I think of an art part, it was due to not having sufficient levels of detail in terms of specifications. Mm -hmm. You had to be very, very, very specific. Right. Plus, um, not necessarily having a point of contact to the country to be outsourced to. And <coughs> not being able to sort of collaboratively enough um, and regularly enough with yeah. the outsourced team. So, uh, so I see that the common problem that you mentioned was uh, a, a huge gap between expectations and delivery. Right. Anyone else would like to throw any uh, points, uh, any, any thoughts on that? <coughs> Our sort of companies are also welcome to share this uh, side of the story if they want to. So these are some of the challenges, uh, some of the failures that we, over a period of time, and we don't say that, you know, we, uh, we are also an outsourcing company, by the way. Uh, uh, but we don't say that we have been best from day one. We have faced, we have seen a lot of these issues coming up with our early engagements, uh, our clients and partners, you know, mentioning that these problems they have faced with their other companies and vendors. And overall, in, in research, these are some of the things that we found out. So uh, I'll just quickly touch base on each of these. Uh, starting from uh, 2 o'clock, unqualified members. You, uh, the partner that you work with, they often will tell you that they have great developers, but when it comes to delivery, when it comes to development, as you just said, you know, what was expected and what was delivered, either documentations were not clear or requirements were not clear, they didn't ask the right questions. And that is competency issue. So unqualified members, who are broad hiring funnel, you know, oftentimes they'll say that, uh, yes, we can deliver this project, uh, we can have, you know, another 20 developers in six months, but when it comes to, uh, uh, when you're there in, three or four months, you know, they may tell you, okay, no, we don't have those size as many people. Can we do with four? Can we do with five? So, and untrained, inexpert recruits are there. Oftentimes, they'll do this to save cost and bring the average cost of their uh, operations low. Immature uh, workflow adoption, ad hoc transitions, and agile inexperiences. A lot of companies still don't understand how to deliver projects in a real agile manner. Agile as a term, is, is, is great, they, they try to uh, adopt it, but they really don't have the right coaching and the right training in-house to be able to deliver things. Scalability challenges, uh, hindered escalations, availability constraints. If all of a sudden, you know, you have, uh, uh, you know, you're looking at uh, hiring uh, or uh, a new opportunity and you need more developers, there may be constraints that these companies may have and not have those developers available. Processes, uh, their processes may not be aligned with your processes or they may not have the complete standards in place. Uh, they the typical supply side mentality. Uh, lost priorities and misalignments. And then there are more, like stakeholder confusion. Uh, the owners, uh, the leaders may not have uh, a clear vision in terms of what these companies are doing. Uh, but when it comes to a joint uh, delivery, there may be challenges that they may be facing in terms of roles and activity alignments. Divested employees, uh, unhappy low energy ownership. Now this is a very common problem we've seen in uh, companies. Uh, they're building companies like sweatshops and you know, uh, developers working nine to five, but then oftentimes there are work pressure, code is not very good, the quality is bad. So what they end up doing is you know, work over, over, uh, uh, over the weekends or late hours to try to fix those problems which leads to pressure, stress, and then, you know, the developers are not happy. They don't have a career path that they are chasing. They don't know where they're heading. So overall, they are just doing something on a nine to five basis. What ends up is you get a bad quality of code. You get a, a, a customer who is not happy because what was promised by you never got delivered. Post project QA issues. So projects get delivered and then testing or QA happens, right? The site is online and now you are fixing problems. Uh, a lot of these companies, a lot of these developers are good at fixing bugs, but not good at preventing those bugs to come up. So that's also a major challenge that we have to think about. Uh, developer QC dual role. So uh, developers and testers. So developers are doing testing, you know, and lack of clarity in terms of who should be doing what. Communication gaps, obvious soft skill dependencies. A lot of people have these. Uh, uh, complaints with the dealing with outsourcing companies, uh, delayed global response cycle. You uh, 
you expect a response or a resolution within a day or two, but then what happens is, you know, it almost takes weeks and there's no response from those people. And obscure operations, ambiguous service reporting, ROI and TDM. TDM is time, time to market uh, concerns. So your project, which was planned to get delivered by maybe, you know, quarter three, it's already the next year and you are still developing uh, the whole thing. So does this sound uh, common to you guys in terms of your outsourcing uh, experiences? or things that you've heard about the, uh, from your friends or the companies that have done outsourcing. Okay, there are some numbers that are uh, uh, there from the same survey, the Deloitte's uh, 2016 Global Outsourcing Survey that we have done, uh, which kind of validates these numbers. I'll just touch upon the, the top three uh, uh, highlight ones, which is providers are reactive rather than proactive. Almost 46% of providers are pro reactive than proactive, right? Good at fixing bugs, but they don't do anything to make sure that bugs don't happen. Problems don't come up. 33% don't provide enough innovation, right? Code is there, but there's not enough research, not enough efforts being put to think about the future roadmap of that project, you know. How is uh, a particular feature going to be like uh, so that there's less effort and better value given to the client? 29% have high staff attrition rate. This is almost uh, three out of every ten uh, developer that you're probably working with in an outsourcing company. He may not be there in a couple of months from now. And then the whole uh, problem of uh, you know transitioning to another developer, uh, uh, you know, onboarding of a person, and then communication challenges and all those things. And there are uh, a bunch of other uh, uh, numbers from the same survey uh, which talks about you know uh, what are the key concerns. And from the same survey, uh, why agencies still outsource? So this is an interesting number that we came up with, uh, came around, which is 59% uh, of these agencies are looking to outsourcing as a cost-cutting tool to, to, to stay competitive. Almost 57% are doing this to enable focus on their core business. Strategic growth, greater operations flexibility, global talent acquisition, shared knowledge and experiences. Now, the question is, how do you change this? If this is how our sourcing is, if, if these are the problems that every agency is facing, uh, but you still need to do this because of your growth goals, your, uh, your scalability concerns, uh, your uh, uh, problems in you know, hiring people based on your project demands and spikes, what do you do to transform outsourcing? So, uh, we have a very simple uh, uh, way of explaining how you do that. First of all, you need to find the right partner, the, the outsourcing partner. Uh, now there are some of the traits that we suggest should be there uh, when you are uh, identifying or vetting a good partner. They should have complementary strengths and weaknesses, right? very important. You are looking for someone who can actually do a job better than you or who has more bandwidth of delivering some aspects that you cannot. So you have good project management, they have good delivery capabilities, that can come together, they can deliver products. Common shared goals. It's very important to have common shared goals, have at least some roadmap that, okay, you know, the next three quarters, this is what we're trying to achieve. This year, we're trying to reach, uh, us, uh, we're trying to acquire maybe 10 new customers. So for that, we'll need X number of more developers. We will need to develop new capabilities in maybe annual days by the end of next quarter. How is your outsourcing partner uh, going to uh, support that? And is he a able to do that? Can he hire more people? What is their process? What is their turnaround time? So uh, having shared goals other than just you know making money together is very important there. Experience and expertise, the, the developer should have, uh, the, the partner should have uh, the right technical capability, domain expertise, uh, you know, multifunctional areas, talent development processes should be there. They should have proper training uh, systems in place. Uh, they should be focused on community uh, contributions and community uh, uh, involvement. Uh, that is very important for open source ecosystems like us. Because if the partners are not really caring about community, uh, uh, they would not have a, a strong grip on those technologies that we are working on. Right? Uh, and they should have a, a strong emphasis on people empowerment, people development, because end of the day, people is what we are partnering for. That was the key challenge. That is what we are getting as part of this engagement, this partnership. 
So they need to make sure, they should have a system in place and you should be convinced that yes, these, are, these guys are actually taking care of their people in, a, in, a, in, in the right manner and the way you would have done had it been your company. Uh, and other things like they should be scalable and all. Uh, the, uh, they should have a strong governance and track record. Uh, they should have a global delivery team. This may or may not uh, be there dependent on your requirements. If you're only uh, needing someone uh, to work from a single location, that's fine. But oftentimes these days companies uh, look for partners who have people uh, and uh, production capabilities in different zones, different time zones. This gives you advantages of, you know, maybe 24 7 support or uh, uh, continuous de development in different time zones. So that, you know, when one team is uh, going to finish their job, there's some other team that can take on work and start delivering stuff to you. Uh, and then the, the regular set of operational tools, processes and standards, uh, like they should have uh, agile capabilities, uh, proper engineering standards, uh, delivery standards, uh, development best practices. Again, those practices, if they are aligned with your practices, that's very important because oftentimes your team would also be working with them. So we'll come to how the, the partnership uh, can be evolved to the next stage. So the first was, the first stage that we just saw was identifying the right partner. Right, there are a few more uh, aspects. We can just take a look at the custom service agreements. Uh, so uh, this allows the partner to uh, make the right promise and be able to deliver on those promises in terms of maybe resolution time, maybe response time. They should have easy contracting, multiple engagement models. Uh, oftentimes we have been seeing uh, something uh, called agency of record model wherein uh, say you will not be uh, uh, interested in dealing with multiple vendors all by yourself. You prefer that when it comes to, uh, uh, say, say, technology solution, you develop a long-term partnership with your, with your partner, and then it's their responsibility to develop those new capabilities, either in-house or as a contractor or whoever, but then deal with it themselves. You should be dealing with one single partner and have a very strong, very closely uh, integrated systems and processes in place, and let them worry about the other stuff. So they should have capabilities of being able to do that. Only then, uh, you know, you can focus on your core and let them provide the value that you have uh, get into, uh, got into this engagement for. Then other aspects like team allocation, they should have uh, a system of uh, team allocation, uh, uh, transparent team allocation. We should be able to see who's available, who's not available, uh, as opposed to, uh, you know, number of people. There are companies who say, okay, I have five developers, you know, you don't need to know who are those developers. That doesn't work. You should know those individual developers on a personal basis. And last but not the least is references and proper industry cracks. You should be able to check with your, uh, in, in your industry or uh, references that they provide, call them up and, you know, confirm that, yes, these are the right people and they have delivered what they are promising. So uh, once you identify the partners, then you, uh, you can follow a, a framework. Now, we have created this framework based on our experience. Uh, this is still a work in progress. But we try to uh, take all of our partners through this process, step by step. Uh, there are these five major uh, phases, or broad phases, you can say, uh, on which we map the entire partnership management uh, and, and so-called partnership maturity management. Uh, and we, when I speak about the company that I, I uh, represent here, we are uh, uh, bringing in the perspective from the outsourcing partner so, you know, the other, other side is what, where you would be looking at this. So, building confidence in the first stage, then establishing trust. We'll, we'll get into the details of these uh, in the next slide. Third is delivering quality, exceeding expectations, and shared reputation. Oftentimes, the relationships are, they pretty much do not go beyond the second stage. You know, you build confidence, you get into a contract, you start working together, quality is being delivered, sometimes work is being done, trust is done, but then beyond that, all any problems comes, your expectation gaps are there, and then the whole partnership relationship goes down for a, for, a, for a toss. So exceeding expectation and shared value creation is totally missing. So these, these, uh, these five stages can help you plan uh, uh, and maintain a, a successful partnership journey, as well as also keep measuring your partner on, on, on various levels, like at what, at, at, at what uh, stage your partner is uh, at with you.
So what we've done is uh, we've uh, we've created a sort of a partner success journey, and we had a we had a session uh, in Drupal Camp that in fact same group if I remember uh, about uh, partnership success journey. Uh, uh, did you anyone want to attend that session by Nathan? Right. So you must have seen this uh, this chart there. So this is a journey map, but basically this journey map is mapping. The, the, the partnership development journey on these five <coughs> broad phases that I just talked about, right? Uh, building confidence, where you're actually getting into a discussions with the partner, defining the engagement, all the nitty of the engagement, defining the processes. This is when you are doing technical discovery, when you are trying to uh, align your technical plan of the engagement as well as the technical capability of the client, and then you come up with a, with a structure, a proposed roadmap, uh, and then you know, propose that to the client as part of the engagement. And then you kick off the, 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 the partnership uh, from the state. So that's building confidence, and you know, somewhere around that's where the establishing trust aspect comes up. This is all about onboarding your partner successfully. Then comes the delivery quality aspect. Now, a lot of these are touch points are missing in uh, a traditional outsourcing model. Uh, which is why they lead to failures. Things like, uh, you know, they don't have systems of nurturing those, 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 those stages. Team member feedback. They don't have proper one-on-one -on -one system happening inside. Continuous delivery is missing. A lot of companies don't have proper KPI instead. So you need to also get into details of those companies and see how they are managing their teams, how they are managing their talent. What are the KPIs? Are their KPIs aligned with growing those team members and then subsequently Providing you better quality so that the project that you get delivered is online with that, right? So you know, by all of these constant check-ins, uh, you would be moving from delivering quality to exceeding expectations. Uh, some say that you know, exceeding expectation is a variable and uh, should not be there, but uh, different different thoughts are about that. Uh, I, I believe that uh, a, a partner who's really committed to a long-term relationship will ensure that all these checks and balances are in place and they'll make sure that you know, they keep exceeding expectations time and again. And subsequently then you would be at a shared value creation stage uh, with activities like proactive consultation, uh, extended teams, extended team and then you may have contracted them for maybe 20 developers. <coughs> uh, uh, if they see a need of uh, uh, you know, uh, looking at maybe Drupal 8 migrations or developing a new uh, platform for you, they should be able to develop an extended team uh, either on cost basis or uh, aligned with your business priorities and be able to offer you. Uh, they should be able to stretch goals. Uh, they should have that DNA in them to be able to stretch goals. Now these are very tough things to really judge at initial stages, but once you move through this partnership journey, once you move through the different phases of a partnership, uh, you should be able to see that. Again, these are perspectives. These are these have got both the perspectives, uh, the client's perspective and the supplier's perspective. But uh, oftentimes, the client is not having uh, a visibility on these kind of things, right? And that's where the whole thing goes down. <coughs> so shared value creation, stretching goals, new horizons, and joint thought leadership. You know, by uh, these are basically mapped on onboarding, nurture, and inspire uh, the three tenets of a successful partnership uh, maturity model, if I may say so. And by doing this, this is how we have created value uh, 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 by you know, following these things properly. Uh, internal alignments, uh, empathy-centered, knowledge sharing. Uh, we have a lot of knowledge sharing in-house and, and with our clients, with our partners, uh, quality team members, low churn turnover. Now, um, again, if developers and uh, uh, outsource uh, resources, some quality resources we call the members, they keep you know, moving companies, it won't do any good for you. So uh, they should have a system in place to make sure. You should also know what's your attrition rate. If you are an outsourcing partner, you know how many people would stay there next year or the year after that. Uh, get some data, and get it, get it validated. Dependable forecasting. They should be able to tell you, uh, uh, you know, how you can forecast your project and their uh, resource availability. Feedback cycles. So we at Aspen we follow a lot of uh, check-ins, uh, checks and balances, and these activities. Things like Net Promoter Score, we often keep checking with our partners, uh, what's their uh, satisfaction levels with uh, <coughs> the engagements, the, the quality of our delivery. Uh, there are routine touch points between different managers on projects, uh, which you should be uh, 
care for the bug. Uh, the workflows should be custom tailored, uh, and the processes should be partner priority focused. Again, uh, priorities may change. Uh, the partner uh, should be able to accommodate those changes. Uh, try create a plan and help you, and be able to solve it as opposed to no, this is the only thing that we had contracted for, and this is only working on it. Without disrupting the original core contract or engagement, uh, we, we, we developed a lot of uh, key performance indicator uh, aligned with these goals. Uh, and we enabled continuous learning. These are all part of the people development. Uh, then maturity models, uh, relationship framework, partner journey mapping. So what we saw was a partner journey mapping. So what we do is we use those phases and those touch points uh, to walk the partnership relationship uh, through and ensure that uh, even marketing is aligned uh, with the, the, the buyers, uh, with the partners on that level. Uh, clear communication uh, facilitated by tech, uh, so, and uh, uh, hiring challenge, hiring uh, efficiencies. So preemptive selection, you know, less than 1% uh, people are being hired. Uh, we made sure uh, that uh, hiring is not done for us to build the company, but to help partners deliver what they have come as for. And uh, last but not the least, uh, having the key ownership uh, in place, uh, things like success managers. So, you know, project managers should really not be just focus about projects. They should be focused uh, on the partnership success on the whole. So they should have their uh, eyes on the bigger picture and a grip on that. They should be able to tell you that, yes, uh, this project is fine, but there's another opportunity that we discussed. So, you know, we can do something about that and how can all of these come together. So a uh, more matured and uh, well-rounded uh, success management professionals at that level to be able to uh, push the whole agenda forward. Uh, and operation streamlining, so uh, again, a uh, lot of work needs to be done in terms of operational efficiency. Uh, matrices are there, uh, regress and checks and balances are there. Uh, overall, and you know, once all of these happen, uh, creation of consultative support and shared value creation as part of value to the decision. So, what I, what I just showed you was uh, using those uh, phases and those actions and touch points and plotting the relationship in a journey. It would take time. Each, you'll have to spend some extra time on each relationship, keep nurturing them over time, but then you can turn around the challenges and, and uh, concerns and failures from a typical traditional outsourcing to a more transformed outsourcing so that uh, the, the outsourcing uh, strategy becomes your growth strategy and plays to your advantage and plays to your strength. So that's pretty much what I had to share uh, based on our experiences of uh, working with partners. Uh, would be happy to take any questions if you have any. This slide would be there on, uh, uh, I think, uh, which feed about this slide, right? Yeah. <coughs> there are some resources. Uh, you can refer to these resources to understand a bit more about each of these. Uh, concept that I just tried to uh, elaborate upon, and uh, my contact details are in you know, email and Twitter handle. All right. I've got one. I've sure. never asked you. I mean, how many years have you been in the, uh, this industry to begin with, with outsourcing to the So around 19, 19, 19 and a half. Seen and I, all these problems, yeah. all the negatives, all the failures, I've seen a majority of these failures happening either as an audience or as a party myself at some stage or the other. So that's where, uh, you know, uh, and I'm sure everyone who's doing outsourcing has some across the problems. Yeah. <coughs> what size of um, team do you So, uh, what's, uh, see, project size, uh, team sizing really depends on projects, right? Uh, from our experience, we've had, uh, you know, two team members on one project, as much as, you know, 15 team members on projects. Those are bigger projects which, you know, uh, different uh, development uh, streams. Uh, there have been uh, instances where uh, uh, we've helped, we've been working at it, which is something that we've been working with in the last couple of months. Is trying to build a uh, an extended uh, outsource uh, development center model, wherein you know uh, the the partner has let's say 20 developers and 
they are working on say five projects. So they elevate those developers, and these are in-house developers in their, in their uh, premises. They elevate these developers uh, as leads of these individual projects, and then our uh, uh, outsourced uh, team comes in and forms the development uh, block of the, the entire team. So they are developers being on site near to, to the client, lead the project, and work with say five of our developers for that project. Again, some of the projects may be smaller, some may be larger. So Yes, yes, because uh, the whole premise is that the agencies would prefer uh, owning that part. They they prefer owning the relationship with the client, mm -hmm. and they also prefer uh, retaining and growing the high margin uh, uh, areas like consulting, uh, uh, you know, business uh, design, uh, system design, UI, UX, uh, discovery workshop, and those things. Right, wherever they need partners should be able to help them and you know, provide more bandwidth. And they should actually be involved from the get-go. So it shouldn't be like, you know, three months down the line, we'll get in contact with you and then, you know, we'll start developing. And the project is being signed up, and that's when someone from the uh, team that is supposed to work on that project should get involved with you. That's a very major uh, uh, winning strategy that we have experienced from our side. At times, is, uh, the client is not very keen on investing effort or money for that. We, we go out and we say, okay, fine, you know, we'll have at least this guy, uh, you know, shadow you for some time. Even on a cost basis, that's fine, because subsequently, success is what we'd like to, uh, end of the day, it's going to, you know, come upon us, right? Project delivery has to be successful. And what's, what's the, um, uh, kind of average duration of successful projects? Because I guess we some of the projects we worked with, we worked on a 10 year out, so some yeah, yeah. <laughs> others were, you know, one year, three year. Yeah. So, uh, it kind of feels that if it's, As you always said, you know, uh, I mean, from my experience, we have been working on certain projects which have which are product engineering, you know, examples for almost four years now. Or there are certain projects that we've been working on for, uh, you know, three or four. So we usually, from our experience, we've not been working on smaller projects than three months or four months. But that's probably because we don't, uh, uh, you know, go in for smaller side projects. And most of our partners who work very closely with us do not have. And sometimes partners have those capabilities, you know. You know one month project, small stuff. Instead of you know documenting stuff and you know working with an external team, they simply get a smaller part done by themselves as well. So yeah, the the long term vision, the the long term plan is where this is more successful than you know short term, quick term. Long -term. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then you should also have you know you should also define the nature of work. So you know projects should be separate and have different separate dynamics, end to end projects, and support engagement should be uh, different. Separate teams should be there. Different uh, operational rigors and systems should be there. There should be proper SLAs on those parts. And then there are other elements like, like continuous delivery. Sure. Uh, you mentioned that you also have experience with like, working with freelancers or just kind of independent developers, remote developers? Uh, see, the whole idea is they are great, right? Independent, in, independence is nothing like independence. But uh, the problem is, uh, partnership is all about making a commitment, right? And then delivering that commitment, and then exceeding at some stage of time. With freelancers or partners, freelancers and contractors, managing and having a grip on that delivery availability is very tough. So if it's a company that's only uh, interested in getting you know, something coded and delivered, they can probably work with it. But if you apply all of those, if you go back and see those steps, those activities, you know, check-ins, coaching, mentoring, you know, maybe hiring a life coach instead of a HR person. So you know, that won't work with a freelancer, right? So you need to you, you need to make sure that you have equal control, equal connect, and you equal people. You're empowering everyone within your organization. I don't know how can you empower freelancers? How can you empower freelancers? Except you know sharing and meeting with them at conferences and uh, sprints and those things. Yeah. Because oftentimes freelancers may also have different uh, priorities. But having said that, uh, we are talking about an outsourcing model, 
And my uh, point of reference is uh, from a remote perspective. Uh, this, is, this probably does not apply to on-site uh, 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 freelancers and contractors, which I uh, feel uh, is a good pool of uh, uh, short-term, from my experiences and talking with a lot of agencies, it's a good short-term. Uh, for short-term, the mid-size project is great, but for longer term, they kind of try to avoid that. No, no, uh, you know, uh, uh, personal uh, comments for any freelancers out here. I've been a freelancer <laughs> myself at some point of time. Any good? Uh, financial system works uh, good for uh, outsourcing, right? But uh, there are chances of number of hours or uh, monthly basis or per project, some, some of them ask for some uh, percentage of the project. So, what can be the best? Well, that really depends on, you know, the company itself. I mean, I cannot suggest that what may work for us may work for you. But uh, from my personal experience of delivering IT services for the last 19 years, I can definitely say that developers are not resources. And, you know, you, just thinking about selling hours is not the right way of looking at it. So then you're only looking at selling a commodity. That's the whole point of failure in this ecosystem. You need to look at solving the problem of your client, of your partner. And with that, a lot more comes in than just you know, a couple of hours. So, right. I mean, there may be times when you need to you know, stretch yourself and uh, do some additional research or you know, maybe uh, try to fix their technical. You can't really build them on every hour, every minute. You have to build all of that in your part, in, 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 your, in, in your rate contracts. Your con uh, rate cards. Uh, second is, you know, I, we prefer doing monthly uh, contracting. It gives us better visibility. It gives the partners better visibility, and uh, they know, you know, how much this is going to cost, like in the next couple of months, <coughs> as opposed to the daily uh, thing. And predictability in terms of talent planning is also important. Right? How will you say? I mean, the partner says, okay, I need, you know, it's like, you know, can you give me 35 hour develop development next week? I hope I was able to answer. Yes. What, what is your experience in terms of the startups that want to uh, go from MVP to the full development <coughs> project? Startups as uh, outsourcing options? No. Yes. A startup that, that wants to develop a, a project yes. using uh, your proposal. So uh, we, we work with startups uh, and uh, but they haven't been very early stages. So, uh, because at Accelerator we don't provide the business consulting uh, services. So, you know, a startup has to reach a certain stage where they have a basic product in place or at least a product design and vision in place. And then it's, if the startup doesn't have their own in-house capability, I think going the outsource or outsourcing route is the best in that case. Because then the startup also needs to look at a lot many other things. Growth business, you know, expand the business plan, maybe get some funding, uh, and uh, they've got limited resources at that point of time. So they should look for uh, partners who can work with them in, I don't know, uh, revenue sharing basis or maybe joint project ownership basis. Uh, something that I've seen work quite well in the Indian ecosystem for, for that. I haven't been interacting much with these startups in the uh, UK in this region. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.
flying back to sleep. Okay, we'll see you around. Right.